name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Today we celebrate the Feast of St. Faustina, mystic, somebody who experienced and encountered the living God and to whom God revealed divine mercy in a way that is extraordinary and, and who has brought that through St. John Paul and through Pope Benedict and, and brought that to us in a way that is a living tradition where we can focus more on the divine mercy. And as we begin to celebrate this sacred mystery, let us recollect the many ways in which we have not lived as his children. But let us also know the divine mercy of our God. You were sent to heal the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You came to call sinners. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You're seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who in the abundance of your kindness surpass the merits and the desires of those who entreat you, pour out your mercy upon us to pardon what conscience dreads and to give what prayer does not dare to ask through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians. I am astonished at the promptness with which you have turned away from the one who called you and have decided to follow a different version of the good news. Not that there can be more than one good news. It is merely that some troublemakers among you want to change the good news of Christ. And let me warn you that if anyone preaches a version of the good news different from the one we have already preached to you, whether it be ourselves or an angel from heaven, he is to be condemned. I am only repeating what we told you before. If anyone preaches a version of the good news different from the one you have already heard, he is to be condemned. So now, whom am I trying to please, man or God? Would you say it is men's approval I am looking for? If I still wanted that, I should not be what I am, a servant of Christ. The fact is, brothers, and I want you to realize this, the good news I preached is not a human message that I was given by men. It is something I learnt only through a revelation of Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord keeps his covenant ever in mind. Lord keeps his covenant ever in mind. I will thank the Lord with all my heart in the meeting of the just under their assembly. Great are the works of the Lord to be pardoned by all who love them. The Lord keeps his covenant ever in mind. His works are justice and the truth. His precepts are all of them sure. Standing firm forever and ever, they are made in uprightness and the truth. The Lord keeps his covenant ever in mind. He has sent deliverance to his people and established his covenant forever. Holy his name to be feared. His praise shall last forever. The Lord keeps his covenant ever in mind.
I give you a new commandment. Love one another just as I have loved you, says the Lord. from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. There was a lawyer who, to disconcert Jesus, stood up and said to him, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? What do you read there? And he replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You've answered right, said Jesus. Do this, and life is yours. But the man was anxious to justify himself and said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, A man was once on his way down from, Jericho, from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of brigands. They took all he had, beat him, and then made off, leaving him half dead. Now a priest happened to be traveling down the same road, but when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite who came to the place saw him and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan traveler who came upon him was moved with compassion when he saw him and went up and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them, and then lifted him onto his own mount, carried him to the inn, and looked after him. Next day, he took out two denarii and handed them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and on my way back, I will make good any extra expense you have. Which of these three do you think proved themself, himself to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the brigand's hands? The one who took pity on him, he replied. And Jesus said, go and do the same yourself. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise Lord. Lord well, for the next little while, we're going to be reading from the book, from the letter to the Galatians. So yeah, you know, you know the drill by now, huh? Dust the Bible off, open it up, go down to the New Testament, and then after you get to Romans, well, you get the four Gospels, you get to Romans, then you'll find Galatians there. And, and it's, it's one of Paul's really remarkable letters. Well, all of Paul's letters are remarkable, but this one is, is, is incredible. Remember in 1 Corinthians, Paul wa was answering a number of questions that were posed to him by the Corinthians, and, and he used it as a catechesis to address issues in the community. Well, in the letter to the Galatians, Paul is answering only one question. And it would seem as if, while he was in Antioch, some of the community from Galatia came down to Antioch and was speaking with him. Because he's incredibly familiar with the nuance of the question and, and of the, the problem that is posed. And his, his, his familiarity with, with what is happening in the community would have, would have come from people who were speaking to him. They didn't have telephone, they didn't have cell phone, no fax, no email, no WhatsApp. So that means a person to person. Because if it was a letter, we would, as what happened in Corinthians, you'd have seen him responding to the letter. What he's responding to is things that people have said to him that he trusts that came from the community in Galatia. The single issue of this, of this text is what constitutes justification? What con how, how are we saved by God? Is it by the belief in Jesus Christ or is it by putting on a whole set of cultural artifacts that we must follow by the law? And that's the single question that is being addressed here. And, and the, the text 
is, is one that is very, very clear, but, but Paul is buffing the Galatians left, right, and center. And his opening remarks, usually when Paul opens a letter, you will see and, 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 and greetings to the saints who live in Galatia and on and on and on. I praise God for you and, and for your faithfulness to him. And you see in Romans, in Corinthians, you see that kind of greeting. There's no thanksgiving for the people of Galatia. There's no wasting time. He starts by saying he's an apostle of Christ. And the next thing he comes between the eyes, he says, I am astonished at the promptness with which you have turned away from the one who called you and have dedicated yourself to follow a different version of the good news. That's like slap slap. His opening words, it ain't no niceties at all. Two slaps on the face and saying, what foolishness am I hearing here? Later in the letter, he will say, you foolish Galatians. And, and he actually will, will chide them in, in a very harsh and drastic measure. But to understand this letter, you have to go back to Acts 15, where the community gathered in, in Jerusalem. Paul and Barnabas had been preaching to the Gentiles, and having preached to the Gentiles the, a, a, a gospel, that required no external adherence to the law as if you were a Jew. It, it required a belief in Jesus Christ, baptism in the name of Christ, and living with faith in Christ. But there were some called Judaizers who not only wanted the Gentiles to become Christians, but they were also proposing that to really be a Christian, you had to take on the full weight of the Jewish tradition. You had to be circumcised, you had to abstain from, from all kinds of things, you had to follow all the Jewish holidays, you had to follow all the Jewish feasts and, and holy days, you had to take on the full cultural trapping of the Jewish faith. And, and this is the great tension. And you see it explored in Acts 15 when Paul and Barnabas, sent by the churches of, of, of Gentiles, went to Jerusalem and there with the elders, and the two that are named are certainly Peter and James, but, but as the elders of the church in Jerusalem gathered and had what we will call the first council the Council of Jerusalem. Like we have the Second Vatican Council, the Council of Trent, the Council of Nicaea, all of these councils. This is the first council, the Council of Jerusalem, where there is a gathering to discuss a topic that is at the very heart of the life of the church. When Pope Francis talks about what I want is a synodal church, a church of synod, what, what he is referring to is a, a church that can resolve the big tensions of the day, not because somebody tweets or Facebooks or puts out in social media their opinion, but what he wants is a church that will come together, that will sit together, that will reason together, that will listen deeply to each other and discern through the Holy Spirit what God is saying to the church and settle the matter through the, through the Holy Spirit and, and inspiration, through a process of discernment. And that's what we see in the church in Acts 15. And what did they decide? They decided that there was to be no imposition on the Gentiles. They were simply to refrain from eating meat that was sacrificed from idols. They were to refrain from sexual immorality. And they were to live a life that was dedicated to Christ. That was it. Nothing extra. And, and what Paul is now addressing to the Galatians is the fact that some 
after the council of jerusalem after the elders have decided after this this doctrine has become the teaching of the church after an agreement with peter and james as the leaders of the church with paul and barnabas as the leaders of the church in in asia after there's a fundamental agreement between these two on the doctrine that must be preached that some judaizers have come to galatia and said to the people of galatia that you must now become jews in in complete measure the men must be circumcised you must observe all the feast days and all the holidays and all the things that the jewish traditions will put forward and and to this paul is responding and he's responding in a in a very forthright manner he says that They've called you to turn away from following the good news and to follow a different version of the good news. Not, they can, not that there can be more than one good news. He says, it is merely that some troublemakers among you want to change the good news of Christ. And let me warn you, if anyone preaches a version of the good news different from the one we have already preached to you, whether it be we ourselves or an angel from heaven, he is to be anathema. He is to be condemned. He is to be put out of the assembly. That is strong language, you know. Imagine that is the opening, the opening line of the letter, that anyone who teaches anything different from what we have passed on to you, let them be condemned. Let them be put out of the assembly. That, that, that is fairly strong. But what is Paul getting at here? Well, you know, if somebody, if you had been given a gift, I came to your house and I, I brought with me, you know, a hundred pounds of pure gold. And somebody came and gave you brass and he says, you see that gold the Archbishop give you? That is really worthless. Let me take that gold away. Let me give you brass. This, this, this is the really valuable stuff. That's what Paul is getting at. That, that having been given pure gold, you're gone now for the fake imitation that cannot bring salvation and that cannot help you. you you're gone for an imitation of what you, you had. You're giving up what is the true gospel, what, what can give you life, and you're holding on to what cannot give you life. And how does Paul so confident in his teaching? Because he's teaching what the apostles have taught. And he's teaching what the apostles have agreed upon together. We could consider the text of Galatians, the reception of the Council of Jerusalem a couple of years after. In the same way, we have to consider a lot of what is happening now, the reception of Vatican II 50 something years later. The, the 50 something years after the Second Vatican Council, there are still people in high places in the church who are saying that was not really a council. And that was really not the teaching. In fact, that was an aberration in terms of the whole history of Christianity. And don't follow it. And that's, that's the, the, the situation that Galatian church was in, the situation that we are in today. And we have to say, even if an angel or somebody of high place, a cardinal, somebody of high position, some, some ambassador or, 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 or some diplomat for Rome, comes teaching to you a doctrine that is different from the doctrine that the Pope is teaching and different from the doctrine that the Second Vatican Council is teaching, you let them be put out of the assembly. That, that's, that's the force of what Paul is saying if we interpret it in today's, in today's experience. You see, we have become a lot more accommodated with stupidity today than Paul was, you know. Paul had no accommodation with stupidity. He, he understood what the good news was, and he understood that it is only in the good news you will find salvation. And therefore, if you trade what is true for what is false, then you will be in destruction to your own soul. And Paul goes on to say, I'm repeating myself, you know, but let me repeat myself. 
We told you before, if anyone preaches a version of the good news different from the one we have already heard, he is to be condemned. He says it twice. In case you miss it the first time. I know when the reader was reading, you thought he was repeating himself and he missed a line and went back. Mm -mm. It's Paul. Twice he says it. And then he goes on to say, so now who am I trying to please, man or God? Because they were believing that Paul was dumbing down the gospel to be able to curry favor the Gentiles, to woo the Gentiles to Christ, giving them half of a gospel and giving them the easy or gospel light. You know, you have Coke light, Sprite light. I don't know why he's drinking because I know what it tastes like, but anyhow, Paul is saying, I gave you the real thing. I didn't dumb down the gospel to attract you and bring you in on a version of a light gospel. I gave you the whole gospel full and complete. I'm not trying to please anybody. So that's what Paul is, is, is working with here. And he's saying, whose approval am I on? If I'm still wanting that, I should not be what I am, a servant of Christ. And the beautiful end of today's lesson when he says, the fact is, brothers, that what... I want you to realize this, the good news I preach is not a human message. And that I was given by men. It is something I learned only through a revelation of Jesus Christ. But surely Paul would have known about the good news by men, that's why he was persecuting the church. What he's saying is that he only knew, he only knew in terms of belief and knew God, knew Jesus, the risen Christ by a revelation of God. We're gonna be reading the book of, Gal of Galatians over the next while. Dust it off and, and let's read together because this is one of those books that, that help us sort out the contemporary challenge that we're facing in the church today. And many of the contemporary challenges, we will see how they come up in the text over and over and over again. But there's only one good news and it is only the good news that can give you life in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your amazing grace, your love, your care, that you have given us a saint, Faustina, who has shown us what the truth of the good news is, the unconditional mercy that you give to us mere human beings who have done such foolish things and that your mercy is without end. We come to you this day and we pray, Lord, that we may come to understand your mercy and that we may be a sign of mercy to your world. Lord, hear us. We pray for our church, we pray for our Holy Father, that he may be a sign of mercy to the church and to the world that you may give him courage to lead us in every way that you desire. Lord, hear us. Lord, we pray for our nation that you may give us courage in these days. And as we hear the budget today, we pray, Lord, that you give us courage as we listen and as we reflect and as we see the way forward. Lord, hear us. Lord, we pray, Father, that you may Bless the many who have placed petitions in our prayer basket. Bless them, Lord, and allow them to know your care. Lord, hear us. We bring our prayer to the Father through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Take our bread, we ask you, take our hearts, we love you, take our lives, oh Father, we are yours, we are yours, yours as we stand at the table you set, yours as we the 
signs of your life with us yet. We are yours, we are yours. Take our bread, we ask you, take our hearts, we love you, take our lives. Oh, Father, we are yours, we are yours. that your sacrifice and mine may be pleasing and acceptable to God the Almighty Father. Lord, accept the sacrifice of your hands for the praise and the glory of his name. Accept, O Lord, we pray, the sacrifices instituted by your commands and through the sacred mysteries which we celebrate with dutiful service, graciously complete the sanctifying work by which you are pleased to redeem us through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. Yes, I'm not too low. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, for in the saints who consecrated themselves to Christ for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, it is right to celebrate the wonders of your providence by which you call human nature back to its original holiness and bring it to experience on the earth the gifts you promise in the new world to come. And so with the angels and all the saints, we praise you and without end we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the true form that they may become for us the body and blood of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. At the time that he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread, and giving thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice. Once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. And drink this cup. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by your Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity. Together with Francis, our Pope, me, your unworthy servant, all the bishops of the AC region and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face and have mercy on us all, we pray that with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with the blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles, and all the saints who please you throughout the ages, we may merit to be coerced to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, and with him, and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, 
All glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, oh, Our Father, who oh, art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. The temptation. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil and graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously granted peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let's offer each other a sign of peace. Lamb of God, Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, you are the God of my salvation. I trust in you and have no fear. I sing of the joy which your love gives to me, and I draw deeply from the springs of your great kindness. Open my eyes to the wonder of this moment, the beginning of another day. Lord, you are the God of my salvation. I trust in and have no fear. I sing of the joy which your love gives to me, and I draw deeply from the springs of your great kindness. Lord, you are the God of our salvation. You are the one that we call upon. And it is only you that can bring us life and life to the full. We call upon you this day knowing that the message of salvation that you gave through your son Jesus Christ, the message that we hold, the message that has been passed on to us from generation to generation, it is that alone that can give life. 
And we want to know, Lord, more clearly that message of salvation. We want to know more clearly, O oh God, what it is that you have given and what it is we have received, that we may live and live fully everything you ask of us. O oh Jesus, my beloved, I love you more than everything else. And I pray today that as I cannot receive you sacramentally, that you will come spiritually into my heart. And that you, as if you have come already, I offer myself to you again and again today, that I may live only what you have handed on to us and receive only what you have given. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Grant us, Almighty God, that we may be refreshed and nourished by the sacrament which we have received, so as to be transformed into what we consume through Christ our Lord. Amen. What a wonderful day we have. So yesterday on the feast of St. Francis of Assisi, the Holy Father issued uh, an encyclical. Although it's his third encyclical, but it's his first social encyclical. And, and this one really is, is directed at, at what's wrong with our world today. And he calls it fraternity. That, that we, we are called as fraternal beings to live in a social harmony. Go and look for it. At least find a great summary of it. And I know that Camsel will be putting out summaries and doing things to help you to access it. But it is a, it is a wonderful text. And, and it's incredible meditation because as our world pivots to individualism, the Holy Father is calling us to what God has handed on to us. We are social beings, and we are created for each other. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us go glorifying the Lord with our life. Thanks be to God. Oh uh -huh.